The 2006 NBA draft is widely regarded as one of the worst in that decade, along with the 2000 draft. So we're here today to find out exactly why that is. Now, honestly, we got some pretty good names here. I can't even lie to you guys. LaMarcus Aldridge, Rudy Gay, JJ Redick, Rondo, Lowry, Millsap, and then, oh my God, the fall off is crazy. It would be a little bit different if we were talking about the entire draft, but overall it was just really disappointing and the top 10 sums that up pretty well let's start it off with number one toronto raptors shall we we look at their 2005 to 2006 roster here some names will jump out to you of course like chris bosh maybe villanueva who was a rookie at the time jalen rose or the red-headed goat matt bonner but the most surprising player to me was a guy named Mike James. The guy averaged 9.9 .9 points throughout his career, but he locked in and scored 20.3 points per game for the Raptors in 05. And they were holding it down on offense too, scoring at a top five rate in the league. But the defense was second to last, giving up 104 points per game, which is 100% one of the reasons they finished the year at 27 and 55. And they knew they needed another big man to help out Bosch in the paint. So they went out and got Andrea Bargnani at the number one pick. He was a great shot blocker, and scouts thought he could turn into a great player down the road. And they were high on his three ball and his footwork in the post, which led him to being compared to, get ready for this one, Dirk Nowitzki. <laughs> no, 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 I don't think so. I do not think so. What is he doing, folks? Why would he shoot the ball? Now, he got off to a strong start in his career, earning a spot on the all-rookie team, even though he was mainly coming off the bench. In March of that year, though, he had to undergo an emergency appendectomy surgery, which caused him to miss 13 games leading up to those playoffs. He made his return, but they eventually lost to the Nets in the first round. In the next season, he saw a bigger role, breaking into the team's starting lineup on a more frequent basis, but there was no breakout year like many were expecting. You know, sometimes you get that sophomore leap year. Nah, not this time with Bargnani. Instead, he slowly started improving over the next two years, leading to his best season as a Raptor and probably the best year of his entire career, which came in the 2010 to 11 season. With Chris Bosh leaving the Raptors to join LeBron and Wade on the Miami Heat, Bargnani was moved to the center position where he started in every game that he played in and stepped up huge, averaging 21.4 points and 5.2 rebounds per game. The previous offseason, Bargnani signed a hefty contract with the Raptors for five years and $50 million, which of course was looking like the perfect move at the time. Unfortunately, not even two years later, injuries would start to take a serious toll on him. Bargnani played in 66 games that season we just talked about, but he wouldn't play in more than 46 games in any other season. After two more seasons and more injuries that were clearly wearing on his mental health, in the 2013 offseason, Bargnani was traded to the New York Knicks. This was supposed to be exactly what the Knicks needed to finally make a deep playoff run with Melo leading the team, but that wouldn't be the case with the Knicks missing the playoffs in both of his seasons with the team and Bargnani missing a lot more time. After two years with the Knicks, Bargnani would be on the move once again, signing with the Brooklyn Nets. After just 46 games with the Nets, he was waived from the roster, putting an end to his time in the NBA. Now, the potential that Bargnani had coming into the league is undeniable, and maybe if it weren't for all those injuries, he could have been a multiple-time All-Star, but I guess we will just never know. After being waived by the Nets, he spent some time playing professionally overseas in Spain, and after retiring, I think it's safe to say Bargnani really isn't thinking too much about basketball anymore. I mean, look at this man now. His Instagram biography, we got, he's a DJ, he's an influencer, blogger, lifestyle advisor. I mean, hey, if these are actually all true, he's enjoying retirement which is always a good thing to see. All right, so I guess the number one pick didn't exactly work out in the long term, but what would the Bulls do at number two? Would they make the same mistake and take the wrong player? Well, yes and no. They traded away the rights to LaMarcus Aldridge for the number four pick who didn't exactly turn out anywhere close to what Aldridge did, but we're gonna get into that in a minute. So instead of the Bulls getting Aldridge, the Trailblazers did, and boy, were they happy about that move. He was coming off being the Big 12 Defensive Player of the Year in his sophomore season at Texas, and along with the great defense that he played, scouts were in love with his post and mid-range jump shot. One of their only concerns, though, was if injuries was going to follow him throughout his NBA career because in his freshman year at Texas, he suffered a season-ending hip injury. 
He later went on to say that it gave him even more motivation to be great, and he carried that right into his rookie season, earning himself a spot on the all-rookie team, even though he wasn't quite a starter at that point in time, it did not matter. But that changed in his second year where he started in every game that he played in. This much bigger role led to Aldridge taking a huge statistical jump, averaging nearly double the points per game of his rookie season, while still being a pest on the defensive end. He wouldn't stop there though. He continued improving almost every year with the Blazers, eventually becoming the main guy for the team. Starting with the 2011 and 2012 season, he turned it up to another level, making the All-Star game each of the next four seasons, averaging a combined 22.4 points and 9.7 rebounds per game throughout those seasons. Unfortunately, this was not resulting in any deep postseason success for the Blazers though. An injury ruined their chances of making it in the 2011-12 season, and they just couldn't get everything clicking even with Damian Lillard being on the come up for the next three seasons. According to the two of them, the relationship was a bit rocky, mainly due to outside voices spreading some misinformation about the two's intentions, such as that Lillard was trying to take the spotlight from Aldridge when it was later stated that he was just trying to be a nice compliment to him. Nonetheless, Aldridge said that he wanted to remain in Portland, but he also wanted a stronger supporting cast around him. So in the 2015 offseason, he signed a four-year, $80 million deal with the San Antonio Spurs. While there are plenty of what-if situations surrounding Aldridge's time in Portland, him signing with the Spurs was ultimately the right move at the end of the day. On paper, it was a match made in heaven. He fit perfectly into their system and made San Antonio arguably the deepest team in the league at the time, featuring Hall of Famer Tim Duncan, Kawhi Leonard, Manu Ginobili, and Tony Parker. Aldridge bought heavily into the team-first mindset of the Spurs at the time, and as a result of this, of course he saw a dip in his production, despite serving as the team's starting power forward. He still found a way to his fifth consecutive All-Star appearance, though, and in the 2016-17 season, he would see his deepest playoff run. They took down the Memphis Grizzlies in the first round in six games, the Houston Rockets in the Western Conference semifinals in six games as well. Then they got matched up against the crazy Warriors team with Durant on the roster. The Warriors were just a little bit too much to handle for the Spurs roster and they swept them in the Western Conference Finals. Aldridge spent three more full seasons with the Spurs, returning to the All-Star game in two of those seasons, and then towards the tail end of his career, in the regular season of the 2020-21 season, he would reach a buyout agreement with the Spurs, and just three days later, he would join Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving, and James Harden on the Brooklyn Nets. Now, it was thought of that this team could be unstoppable with all of its veteran star power, and Aldridge might finally get that ring that he deserved. But he would have his season cut short and would be forced into retirement due to serious health concerns coming from an irregular heartbeat. After being medically cleared, Aldridge returned to action for the Nets, mainly playing a bench role for the team, and at the tail end of the regular season, he would retire from the league, ending his career with seven All-Star appearances, five appearances on the All-NBA team, and an appearance on the 2006-2007 All-Rookie team. Recently, Aldridge has expressed interest in potentially becoming a part of the Spurs coaching staff, which would probably benefit Victor Wemanyama greatly. I'm just saying, I would love to see that. I'm sure he is much more focused on his health now as well that he's retired and just enjoying spending time with his family. I hope he's doing well. Time to move on to number three, where the poor Charlotte Bobcats were on the clock. To be fair with you, Emeka Okafor was looking like a good pick from two years ago after winning Rookie of the Year award, so this could be the start of a big turnaround for this franchise. Nope. It was certainly not that, actually anything but that. They decided to go with Adam Morrison, who many people compared at the time to Larry Bird. He looked like an old school talent coming out of college who did whatever it took to win and was a great leader. He went on to have a solid rookie season where he averaged 11.8 points per game, earning him a spot on the all-rookie team. However, he struggled to break into the starting lineup, starting in only 23 out of 78 games that he played in, mainly due to his poor defense and bad streaky shooting nights. Shortly before the following season kicked off, Morrison tore his ACL in a preseason game against the Lakers that would force him to miss the entirety of the 2007 to 2008 season. Unfortunately, once he made his return from this injury, his numbers would then take a huge plunge, down to him scoring just four points per game and having his minutes more than cut in half as well. Towards the tail end of his returning season, the Bobcats had enough of him, and Morrison was sent to the Lakers along with Shannon Brown in exchange for Vladimir Radmanovich. Even when he got to LA, nothing was going right for him individually, and he was only on the court enough to attempt about one to two shots per game. At 
the end of the day, if there was one bright spot about Morrison's career, it's that he walked away from the Lakers with two championships under his belt. After the 2009 to 2010 season was over, Morrison's time in the league came to an end. He went to play overseas in Serbia. After retiring from basketball, he has done a lot with radio and podcasting. He's also a basketball analyst for Gonzaga and has taken the mustache completely off. Clean shaven, looks like a whole new person, honestly. Moving on to number four, we mentioned the Bulls earlier passing up LaMarcus Aldridge to take a shot on another player here. And let's just say the trend of mediocrity would continue at this point with Tyrus Thomas over the long term. But it actually didn't start off too bad. Thomas wasn't the type of player to take 15 shots a game. He was the guy hustling for rebounds and doing everything he possibly could to block shots, which he was great at, by the way, because of his insane 7-3 wingspan. Coming off being named the SEC Defensive Player of the Year at LSU, his help defense was some of the best that the league had to offer, which helped the Bulls to a 49-33 record in his rookie year. Thomas struggled, however, to break into the starting lineup in his rookie season, starting at only four of the 72 games that he played in, but he was a very effective player coming off the bench, which earned him a spot on the all-rookie team as well. The Bulls also made the playoffs this year, but lost to the Pistons in the second round in six games. Thomas continued playing well and working his way up the rotation throughout the next few seasons, starting in 61 of the 79 games he played in during his final full season with the Bulls. Now, this would arguably be the best season of his entire career, in which he averaged 10.8 points, 6.4 rebounds, and 1.9 blocks per game. But around the midway point of the 2009-2010 season, he found himself on the Charlotte Bobcats. Despite a change of scenery that he likely did need, Thomas would go back to struggling to see the starting lineup during his time in Charlotte. He continued to regress and see a lesser role with the team in each of his three seasons as a Bobcat and was waived from the team in the 2013 offseason. After that year, he found himself in the D League and his final stop in the NBA would come in the middle of the 2014-15 season when he received a 10-day contract with the Memphis Grizzlies. Thomas played in just two games during that contract, shooting 100% from the field, making the only shot he took. After retiring from the NBA, Thomas has went on to become an assistant coach at Liberty High and is a mental health advocate. On the clock at number five, the Hawks took a player that was completely dominant in college, but his skill just never translated well to the NBA. If I told you Sheldon Williams averaged over three blocks in college and over nine rebounds per game, you would have to think his defense would at least translate to the next level. I'm sure that's also what the Hawks thought too. He entered the draft after two consecutive Defensive Player of the Year selections and three ACC All-Defensive selections in his four years at Duke, and scouts thought he was one of the best shot blockers in all of college basketball. So when the Hawks selected him with the fifth overall pick, they were expecting a big help on that side of the basketball, but his abilities wouldn't translate too well throughout his NBA career. Although he started in under half of the games that he played in, it would be the strongest season of his career offensively and defensively, averaging 5.5 points, 5.4 rebounds, and 0.5 blocks per game. Midway through the 2007-2008 season, Williams found himself on the Sacramento Kings, but would not start in a single game for them, and at times even struggled to see the floor at all. This trend would continue throughout his time on the Timberwolves and Celtics as well, but in the 2010 offseason, Williams signed a one-year deal with the Denver Nuggets, where it appeared that things were finally starting to turn around for him. Despite averaging similar stats to what he put up almost every season up to this point in his career, he would start in 32 out of 42 games that he played in with the Nuggets, at least averaging over 5 rebounds. Right when things looked to be turning around though, he would be part of a blockbuster deal that sent Carmelo Anthony to the New York Knicks. He then found himself on the New Jersey Nets next season where he finished out his career. Despite playing a larger role than he had through the middle stretch of his career, he still wouldn't see another opportunity in the league after his time with the Nets was over and would be forced into retirement after the 2011-2012 season. I think it's safe to say that at the end of the day, Williams' size was one of his biggest downfalls. Sitting at around 6'8", six 6'9", foot six foot might have worked in college, but once he was playing against bigger competition in the NBA, who was also more athletic, he just couldn't keep up. Williams used to be married to Candace Parker, and they actually have a teenage girl together, but after retiring, he spent some time scouting for the Nets, coaching in the G League, and played a bit of basketball in China as well. Up at number 6, the Blazers would trade with the Timberwolves for Brandon Roy, who would turn into the biggest what-if of this entire draft. 
Coming out of Washington, Roy looked like the complete package. His IQ, shooting ability, and ball handling were all top tier, and he got off to a scorching hot start to his career, averaging 16.8 points, 4.4 rebounds, and 4 assists per game, while shooting an elite 37.7% per three. All this earned him the Rookie of the Year award, even though he missed a fair amount of the season due to an impingement in his left heel. In only his second season in the league, Roy would make his first All-Star appearance, and it was clear that he was well on his way to potentially being one of the biggest names that the league had to offer. He averaged 19.1 points, 4.7 rebounds, and 5.8 assists per game. He made the All-Star game in the following two seasons as well, with the best year of his career coming in the 2008-2009 season, but he would never be able to lead the Trailblazers to a deep playoff run due to constant injuries. These would come to a head in the 2010-11 season where he underwent surgery on both of his knees. He would end up retiring from the league following this surgery, but would make a short return onto the Timberwolves in the 2012-13 season. He could only sadly muster five games before undergoing another surgery, ending his season. Anyone who got the privilege to watch Roy during his short time in the league knows he had the potential to be great. Had he been able to avoid these constant and serious injuries that plagued his career, there is a strong chance that he could have gone on to have a Hall of Fame caliber career and likely would have been the best player from this draft class. After all of the surgeries, Roy is forced to live with severe arthritis that is just one step away from a double knee replacement. Since retiring, Roy has made a huge impact as a high school basketball coach in Seattle. He led Nathan Hale to a perfect 29-0 record and a national championship in the 2016-17 season, won three more titles after that, won Coach of the Year, and several of his protégés have made it to the NBA, including Michael Porter Jr. Up at the 7th overall pick would be another from the top 10 that would struggle to see anywhere near the same success in the NBA that they did in college. During his time at Villanova, Randy Foy came away with two consecutive All-Big East selections and one Big East Player of the Year award, and the Celtics would take him with the seventh overall pick, but he bounced between the Blazers and then the Timberwolves before he played in a single game. This was yet another player from this list that would struggle to break into the starting lineup, but despite that, Foy still had a very solid rookie season, averaging 10.1 points per game while shooting a very respectable 36.8% for three, which earned him a spot on the all-rookie team. Foy's best year as a member of the Timberwolves and arguably the strongest year of his entire career would come in the 2008-2009 season, where he averaged 16.3 points and 4.3 assists per game. The 2009 offseason is when Foy started his journey throughout the league. From the Wizards, to the Clippers, to the Jazz, to the Nuggets, to the Thunder, and finally the Nets, all of these seasons were just a bit lackluster compared to what many knew his potential could have been. Although he did perform okay for about 5 years after his Timberwolves run, averaging around 11 points per game. Many people might not know this, but Foy actually has a rare condition that 1 in every 10,000 people have called Situs Inversus which means all his organs are on the opposite side of his body. The heart, for example, is usually on your left side, but Foy's is on his right. Just something I found interesting, but after retiring from the NBA, Foy has been focused on landing more players' NIL deals based at Villanova and used to have an Apple podcast called Outside Shot with Randy Foy. All right, finally at number eight, things were starting to look up again as the Rockets took Rudy Gay, but immediately traded him and Stroh Miles Swift to the Grizzlies for Shane Battier. Battier turned out to be a solid player though, so you really can't hate on this decision to give up Gay. Gay started off his career hot, starting in over half of the games that he played in and averaging 10.8 points and 4.5 rebounds per game, landing him a spot on the all-rookie team. Then he took a massive jump in his second season, starting in all 81 games that he played in and averaged 20.1 points, 6.2 rebounds, and 1.4 steals per game. After that season, he continued playing well, averaging close to 20 points per game for four more full seasons before being traded in the middle of the 2012-13 season to the Toronto Raptors. This would end up being a short stint in Toronto though, as he was traded to the Kings just after about a year. Gay was still a great addition to this Kings team and played a huge role in his four seasons with the team, still averaging close to 20 points and 6 rebounds per game. The 2017-18 season, Gay was seeking out greener pastures in free agency and signed with the San Antonio Spurs in hopes of winning a ring. 
He took a reduced role with the Spurs, mainly serving as a bench piece, but despite this, he was still a very reliable scorer and a solid defender. However, his hopes of winning a ring with the Spurs would never come to fruition, and after four years with the team, he was on the move yet again, this time landing him on the Utah Jazz. With the Jazz, he would still be a bench player, however, he would begin to show massive signs of regression, him being 35 years old in his first year with the team. His final season playing in the league came in the following year where he averaged a respectable 5.2 points and 2.9 rebounds per game while playing just under 15 minutes a game. Despite only retiring with an all-rookie appearance, that doesn't quite do Rudy Gay justice. While he was never the star player, he was an incredible supporting piece and a player that any team would love to have on their roster. Since leaving the Jazz just last year, Gay has been bouncing around in free agency. He went to the Hawks, then to the Thunder, and finally to the Warriors, but was waived before the current season began. Now we have to shift back to the reality of this draft class, which would be another player at number 9 who didn't live up to his potential. The Warriors selected Patrick O'Brien, and let me tell you, this was a big dude. His 7'5 to 7'6 wingspan and 9'4 inch standing reach made scouts think that if he was molded by the right coaching staff, he could end up being a generational talent. Despite this, it was well known that O'Brien would be a project player. While he showed a good amount of potential during his time at Bradley, he was still a very raw talent. Despite all the question marks, the Warriors still selected him with the 9th overall pick, but almost immediately, it was made clear that things were not going to work out in Golden State. This was through no fault of the coaching staff, but more on the front office for taking such a risk on him. O'Brien was alright in the G League, but he had to fight to even see the floor at all in Golden State. He played in just 40 total games throughout his first two years, with the Warriors coming off the bench in all of them, where he averaged 1.7 points and 1.3 rebounds per game. Golden State didn't pick up his third-year option, and O'Brien hit the free agency market. He ended up signing a two-year, $3.1 million deal with the Boston Celtics after an impressive workout in the 2008 offseason. While Boston had high hopes for him as a backup for Kendrick Perkins, they would end up trading him at the deadline to the Toronto Raptors for Will Solomon. O'Brien would be given a chance early on with the Raptors, starting in 3 out of 13 games that he played in. In this role, he saw an uptick in minutes, but not nearly enough that a normal starter would, and it was still clear that he didn't have what it took to see regular minutes every single game. His final year in the league would come in the 2009-2010 season, in which he played in only 11 games with the Raptors. While O'Brien had a lot of potential coming into the league, no coaching staff was able to develop him into a star that he could have very well been. After retiring, Patrick has spent most of his time doing private coaching sessions with Coach Up in Las Vegas. And finally at number 10, the Supersonics took a near 7-foot center who would not turn out nearly to be what they had hoped. Hamid Sene was another big man with a 7-foot-8 wingspan, making him an elite shot block. Along with this, he was very athletic for his size and a force on the defensive end of the basketball. The weird part about this is that he only began playing basketball just three years before he was drafted, and as a result of this, he still had a lot to learn and many areas of his game to develop. Many were comparing him to Dikembe Mutombo at the time, and despite there being more than a few red flags around Sene, the Seattle Supersonics selected him with the 10th overall pick. He struggled through his rookie season only playing in 28 games and starting in just three of them, averaging 1.9 points and 1.6 rebounds per game. Things would not get any better in his second season with the team either, and midway through the 2008-2009 season, he was cut from the Thunder and picked up by the New York Knicks for just one single game, scoring 3 points and pulling in 5 rebounds. And unfortunately, that would be the last time we saw him play in an NBA game. After retiring from the NBA, Sene spent some time bouncing between different overseas leagues along with being a part of the Austin Spurs, who were a part of the G League. If you guys enjoyed this video, as always, make sure to drop a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel if you're new, and check out some of my other videos.